morning, everybody. Today is a very strange day because I'm not over there. I'm over here. And I'm over here because of these beautiful, beautiful strawberries that came from the Creek View Ag Department in Cherokee County, Georgia. And today we want to honor the kids who are in the ag program. I love kids who love farming. I love kids who enjoy the animals and the care of the crops and birthing a calf and all the things that they do in farming lives. And the uh, Creekview Department is fantastic. And to Mr. Wilkie, congratulations in, in pulling off a wonderful, wonderful program that the kids are really proud of and proud to be a part of. Now, the reason these strawberries are here is because we had a strawberry sale with the school and they sold these amazing strawberries for $22 a flat, which is a really good buy. And number one, they were great quality, but we have a little tiny bit of a problem. Parents have forgotten to pick them up. So if you have not gotten to the school and picked up your strawberries, you need to do it today because they need to be processed and either made into jelly or made into strawberry shortcake like I'm gonna do today. I happen to know that my crew loves strawberry shortcake. So I've chosen three things. We have pound cake, and we have Twinkies, and we have uh, Little Debbies. And these Little Twinkies are the coolest things ever, and it's called a snackable bouncer, and I love this. So I'm gonna make three different kinds of strawberries, and what I've done is I've already capped the strawberries, and I'm gonna do something healthy to them. Rather than coat them in sugar, I'm coating them in natural pineapple juice. Now this won't be as sweet as a lot of recipes you would be using, but I love, love, love pineapple in its own juice. And so I just decided rather than sugar them up and make the whole crew absolutely crazy, we're gonna do this. So I think this is gonna work. Now we're gonna let them sit for just a little bit in the juice and there you go, let's put a little bit more. And again, this is pineapple packed in its own juice. There's no sugar added to this. So we have the fresh fruit of the strawberry, healthy, a lot of vitamin C, a lot of vitamin A out of strawberries. And then we're gonna add three different things. I'm gonna give you a choice. Do you wanna really sugar it up and your kids go crazy? Or do you want to tone it down and just use a little bit of Cool Whip? Now, if I wanted to sugar up my kids, the simplest thing, and I was thinking about this, we're gonna have a camp program down in Ball Ground this summer, and I, I love to teach kids to cook. And I thought this is such an easy way to show them the bounty of today and create something that they can have for a snack. This may not be the healthiest snack in the world because this one's gonna have some sugar. This one is gonna have some cool, some of the uh, whipped cream. And then this one's gonna have Cool Whip. And now if I were not in a hurry this morning, I would have gone to Ingalls and I would have bought the sugar-free Cool Whip or I would have bought the light Cool Whip, but I just got the regular today. So now I'm gonna start with these little bad boys. And this is called a bouncer. And it is, everybody loves Twinkies. You just love these. And this is, it's got a little bit of filling inside it. So it has a little bit of sugar. And when you look at this, I'm gonna put one in the bottom and then I'm gonna put some strawberries. And then I'm gonna put some Cool Whip because I'm the Cool Whip Queen. So I put a little Cool Whip and then I'm gonna put another bouncer. So how cool is that? And then we're gonna put a little bit more strawberries and then we're gonna put more Cool Whip. Now, did that take me about 30 seconds to do, guys? How cool is that? How cool is that? And there, I'll sit it right there. So now the next one we're gonna do, we're gonna do, this is the Little Debbie, and this has strawberry filling. So this one will be a little bit sweeter, but I just took this Little Debbie that we bought, Little Debbie box on sale today, two for $5. So you do the shortcake rolls. And it does have a little bit of filling in it and has a little bit of strawberry glaze in it. So it makes it a little bit sweeter. So again, we go back to the strawberries and we're trying to keep it healthy, but this one is gonna be a little bit sweeter. So I don't know who in the crew is gonna really want the sugar, sugar, sugar. And then we're gonna put a little Cool Whip in this one. And then we're gonna add a little more of the strawberry Little Debbie. And again, this has filling, it has a little bit of icing. These are the simplest, easiest desserts. And honestly, if you do these ahead of time and you don't let your guests know that you have cheated and used all this store-bought stuff, 
The only fresh ingredient that you've really used is strawberries and it's because they're in season. And I can tell you RNA Orchards here in Ella J is getting strawberries in and they always have fantastic strawberries. So there you go. There's another one. Now how quick and simple was that one? The next one is going to be the one I would choose to eat because it has pound cake. Nothing any better than Granny's good old pound cake. So we're putting some pound cake in. We're going to put the strawberries and then we're going to end this one when we, we're going to put some Cool Whip in this and then we're going to squirt the whipping cream on it. So a little bit of that, then a little bit more strawberries, make it pretty. You know what I'm going to do to this one because I love pineapple? Let's put a little bit of pineapple in there too. And then we're going to do this. And oh my, you know, the first thing you learn about cooking on television is you open everything first and make sure they work. So y'all, we've got three products. And the kids would love this. Okay. There's pineapple and strawberry with pound cake. Here's strawberry with the Little Debbie shortcake. It probably has the most sugar content. And then here's the one that I really, really like because I love those little, they're called poppables. And basically it's because you can pop it in your mouth. It's a mouthful. So there are a couple of those in there. So simple, so easy. Next year, be sure and get in on the strawberry program and get in touch with Creekview, the ag department, and say, hey, I want to be sure and buy some of those amazing strawberries y'all sell every year. They're great to make jelly out of. They're great just to keep in your fridge. But I will tell you, you have to process strawberries fast. And being in the trucking business for 38 years, I can tell you when you ship strawberries, you better not stop to see your mother-in-law in Arkansas when you're heading in from Arizona with them. You better get them to the house. Very, very perishable. So take care of your strawberries. Get out today. Go to RNA Orchards. Visit the nice folks out there and pick up some strawberries and make yourself a dessert. We're going to go now to a commercial and to one of my favorite interviews by Larry Gatlin from the Gatlin Brothers. So hang tight. Here we go. Whether you're in the mood for chicken strips, a delicious burger, our classic banana split, or an upside down thick blizzard treat, we've got you covered. Hot and fresh food every day, every time. And delicious DQ soft serve make the perfect pair at your favorite place. Not fast food, fan food fast. Your Blue Ridge, Ella J, and Jasper Dairy Queens are your meet, eat, and treat headquarters. Thank you for choosing DQ, how may I serve you? United Country Talking Rock Realty says welcome to North Georgia. The leaves are falling and the mountains are calling. Take the back roads and really get to know North Georgia. Combine the amazing workmanship of SGC groups, transforming the forgotten to the fabulous. Teamwork makes the dream work. For buying, selling, or flipping, call Sherry Martin at 404-375-0590 or Evelyn Calhoun at 770-733-0779. Whether you're swimming in the sea or splashing in the pool, making a masterpiece or just making memories, writing a great American novel or writing your term paper that's due tomorrow, whatever you do in life, Farmers is here to protect it. For all your insurance needs, call Donald Curtis in Blue Ridge. Georgia Medical Treatment Center now has two locations to bring you the high quality holistic care you've come to know and expect. We treat neck, back, and joint pain with chiropractic care and injection-based treatment without the need for surgery or prescription painkillers. Our medical weight loss program can also provide relief while ridding your body of toxins, pounds, and inches while improving your overall health. Call today for a free consultation, 770-345-2000, or go online to georgiamtc.com. 
The family's visit to the forest inspired a beautiful question. Mother, mother, am I a tree? You tell me to stand tall. You tell me to stay rooted. I think I am a tree. My child, my child, of course you are. But what kind of tree will you be? The kind to hug or the kind to climb? Doesn't matter what you choose, so long as you choose to be a tree that's kind. Make the forest part of your story at a park near you. Find one at discovertheforest.org. making your way back to your seats, please. We'll get underway with a fabulous show. There aren't too many people that you can say consummate entertainers are really mean it. There aren't too many people you can say that can sing any genre of music and really mean it. And there aren't many that have many hits under their belts as this performer that I'm about to bring out to you. So if you would, please make welcome one of the greatest voices in country music ever, Larry Gannon. So I went and started uh, writing songs. Dottie West brought me to Nashville. See, most people come out here, they just start singing their hits. Houston, not Thomas. We're going to do all those, I promise. But here's the deal. They were in college, like I say, so when they graduated, uh, we came to Nashville, you know. I was already there for about a year and a half. Started a little solo career, but I knew that we have been singing since we were little boys. Next year will be the 60th year that we've been singing music together, and I've never had two better friends and two better partners. They are not backup singers. They are what the Gatlin Brothers sound all about. Welcome to Brother Steve, Brother Rudy, hey! Yeah, they are. Hey, do we have house lights? Can we turn house lights up? Do we have house lights? Do we have any veterans here? I know we have veterans. If you're a veteran of our armed services, stand up right now. You're a special for the Gatlin Brothers. Give them a hand. So you say that everyone in the Rancho Carmen. Let's let them stand up too. They deserve it. Come on. Do we have a flag? There's a flag in there. There's a flag in our hearts. Here's how we start every show. Oh, say can you see by dawn's early light what so proudly we hail at the twilight's last gleaming whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight
Next year will be our 60th year of singing music together. We've been very blessed. And I reckon, after 60 years, it was good for Daddy Fern. Well, what it was for. I mean, well, it, where does somebody go to fire us? I mean, where are they? So for those of you who are singing for the first time, this may not be the weirdest thing you can ever <laughs> I may get there over up here next with him. All right, these nice people are paying us very well to do this. Well, not this particular thing here, but the, the singing part. And thank you, kind sir, for your, your wonderful introduction so far ahead of me. 
fruit that I was, you know, really a great singer. <laughs> I'm going to be here in a minute. So, here's what I'm saying. We've been up here. How many times have we done this? 15, 20, we did it every other year for about 30 years. And we love it. The crowds are always wonderful. Uh, the money is good. You know, uh, they, they just, they print it right there before we get here every day. Right? It's a little good. And usually the crowd, they know these songs and recognize these songs because they were really big hits. We've got a young lady here in the front row. She's going, dear God, I wish that was Josh Turner. <laughs> he don't know what I know. He's great. He was, we, we did a show. He closed our part of the show last week somewhere. So here's the deal. Young lady, we're glad you're here. Uh, uh, these folks behind you and around you who are a little, uh, they're a little, uh, wiser, uh, they're mature, they're more mature, and, and all that, and we're going to start this song again, and they're going to act like it was a really big hit, because I know you don't remember it, but they did, so... Love, love, love Strawberries, and I love, love, love the Gatlin Brothers. And they are going to be at Hiawassee again this year, so make sure and be a part of <coughs> all the festivals going on at Hiawassee. Can y'all tell them back to coughing? I'm still on steroids. Still got some issues, but it's better than it was, so just trying, trying, trying to get through. 
Now, looky, 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 remember, next year, get on the list for Creek View. When, when the Ag Department at the school sells strawberries, they deliver them intact, beautiful. These were $22 a flat, and they are fantastic strawberries. They have so much flavor, and I've bought strawberries lately who had no flavor, but I bet you if you go to RNA Orchards here in LJ, you will find some amazing strawberries too. I've made three more desserts, and this one is the one with, ha ha, little Debbie strawberry shortcake rolls, and I cut them up in little slices. Then this one is the one with, which is really, really cool, the bouncers. This has a little bit of uh, filling, icing in it, so it's a little bit sweet, a little bit sweet. And then this one I just did with fruit and then a little, um, one of the uh, poppables on top of it. So a little bit variety. This is a great project to teach your kids. If your kids are gonna be home from school all summer long and you think, oh, what am I gonna do to entertain them? Choose some very, very simple recipes and spend time in the kitchen with your children. You'll be glad that you did. One day you will come home and they will have dinner made for you and it will be really, really cool. I did that for my mom and she was so excited. I was in the fifth grade and she was amazed that I'd set the table, did the dinner, did everything on my own. So, <coughs> okay guys, it is kicking up and I am having trouble breathing again and it's driving me crazy. But today, I was lucky enough last night to spend some time with Dr. Ken Wheeler. He was our speaker at the Ball Ground Historical Society. He talked about slavery. He talked about the Indian removal of the Cherokee, which was heartbreaking. And I've been in a down, down mood ever since then. I just thought, oh my gosh, how did we get by with doing what we did to the Cherokee? I want you to get to see a part of his presentation last night. So I'm gonna go to that for a few minutes. And I want you to get interested in the history of Georgia. I want you to get interested in the area where you live. I want you to come and join the Ball Ground Historical Society and get to know the nice folks in Ball Ground who know all about the past. It's really, really cool. And Dr. Wheeler did a great job presenting and Dr. Joe Kitchens was there too. And we love Dr. Joe, he's just amazing. And he knows lots about the Cherokee removal. There are gonna be a lot of things happening when, when you listen and you think, and you're like, wow, did we really do that in America? Yeah, we really did, and it's really, really sad. If you don't have a copy of the book, Cry of the Eagle, you can go to the library in Ball Ground and check it out. You need to read it. You need to hone up on a little bit of the history of what happened to the Cherokee, because if you don't know and you live in the area, you should know. And you should know that many of you are walking on sacred ground because the Cherokee were removed from that area, and there's a lot of history still there. So. We're gonna to go to Dr. Wheeler's presentation now for just a little bit, and then I'll be back with you shortly. Just in case people get rowdy. <laughs> <laughs> Got the cattle already. <laughs> so thanks so much for having me. I've been to the Ball Ground Historical Society once before. I heard Lisa Tressler talk about a Unionist family up in this neck of the woods during the Civil War, and uh, so uh, so I'm pleased to be back and delighted to be introduced by Joe Kitchens uh, for our time together working uh, at Reinhardt in Valeska and the Funk Heritage Center. And you know, uh, it's it's true that over time I've you know become more and more interested and just tried to. Uh, you know, uh, grow where I'm planted, and, and that's really meant. The Etowah Valley, uh, Cherokee County, North Georgia. And, and you know, now I've got a book. I know. Yeah. Modern Cronies out of the University of Georgia Press. Uh, but, uh, you know, brought a few copies tonight. Okay. But, uh, but uh, I'm, I'm just going to go, uh, I'm just going to, talk us through some things. Parts, you'll know. Parts, I'll bet you don't know. So stick with me for all of it. And, uh, and the first thing I want to say is the Southern Gold Rush was a big deal. Okay, the Southern Gold Rush was a big deal. It had huge implications for the development of Georgia. And, you know, when you read historians who talk about the Southern Gold Rush, they're interested in it, but a lot of times they treat it kind of like a self-contained event. They're like, yeah, there was a bunch of gold, 
And then eventually they discover gold in California. And then it's just like, you know, well, got the gold dome in Atlanta, you know, but really, and I, I have to say, no. First of all, the Southern Gold Rush was the largest gold rush in American history at the time that it happened. There had never been anything like it. And for a few decades, a lot of gold was coming out of North Georgia. So much, right, that the federal government put a branch of the U.S. Mint here in Dahlonega. Mm -hmm. And that meant created coins, but really this was just a fraction of the gold that was coming out of the hills of North Georgia because there was at least one private mint that operated in Gainesville. A lot of gold that was mined was worked into jewelry. There were international mining companies that set up shop here, and they often took the gold that they mined back to their home country rather than circulating it in the American economy. So it's difficult to get a firm grasp on how much gold was coming out, but it was a lot. And so, of course, you know, in, at the end of the 1840s, you know, Sutter's Mill in California, right? And a lot of people from here, they're like, all right, here we go. And so, boom, they went on, they went on out west. But in 1829, when it became publicly known that there was gold in North Georgia, it drew international attention. Thousands of people showed up within just the first few weeks to try their fortune. And there had been earlier gold strikes in Virginia and North Carolina. But once the strikes happened in Georgia, rich strikes in Georgia, what people realized was there's a gold belt. Like it's not just isolate, you know, they just start, you start running and you, you, they realize, oh, look at that. It runs. Virginia, North Carolina, all the way across Georgia, and it even goes into Alabama a little bit. And so, even if there hadn't been strikes everywhere, you knew you could just plot the dots and start like running your lines across your map and you kind of knew, okay, right? Like here's where the gold probably is. And much of that gold belt ran through the Cherokee Nation. And the Cherokee Nation lay mostly in Georgia, but it was not subject to Georgia. You know, as the Supreme Court would later say, the Cherokee Nation was a domestic, dependent nation. It wasn't a foreign nation. You know, it wasn't like Egypt, China. It was a domestic nation. It was a nation in the United States. It wasn't an independent nation. It wasn't an independent country, right? It was dependent. Domestic, dependent but also a nation, okay, a nation. When the federal government dealt with it, the cabinet secretary in charge was the secretary of war, right? I mean, this was, you know, you thought of this not as like secretary of the interior, right? You thought about this as like a people who you had to reckon with. And despite the federal attempts to stabilize the situation, as soon as gold is discovered and people realize it must go across the Cherokee Nation, the Cherokee Nation is inundated with white gold miners. And the federal government tries to keep people out. They would show up and they bust up mining equipment and burn down your shacks and stuff. And, uh, uh, you know, those miners, they'll just go outside the Cherokee Nation, wait for nightfall, and then they'll sneak in. And they'll scoop ore into sacks and haul it out by morning. And then they'll spend part of the rest of the, you know, the day going through their ore to see what bits of gold they can find. And it was a mess. Okay? It was a mess. But, of course, the upshot of this in Georgia is that it puts a great deal of pressure on the Cherokee Nation. So a lot of Georgia whites, they're interested in that land. And the thing is, they've got an ally in President Andrew Jackson, right? Because Jackson, he's already trying to please his voters. See, do people who are part of the Cherokee Nation, do they vote for President of the United States? Nope. So they're about as worthwhile as, I don't know, kids, because they don't vote, right? You know, so they're, they're, no, they're in their own nations. They don't vote for President of the United States. Jackson, 
you know, he felt like he got jobbed out of the presidency in 1824, and he got it in 1828, and he is darn sure he wants it again in 1832, okay? And so he's going where the votes are, and that's Georgia Whites, okay? And so he pushes for and signs into law the Indian Removal Act of 1830, and it promised that the Cherokee Nation would no longer exist in Georgia. And so the state of Georgia says, hot dog, and they, you know, on, on the basis of that legislation, they s start lotterying out, you know, lands across the Cherokee Nation, land lotteries, gold lotteries, 1832, 1833, and this, this gave out these Cherokee Nation lands to white people in Georgia. And this brought about sort of fascinating years. They're sad, but also just gripping that a lot of times we don't even talk about, where the people of the Cherokee Nation are all still, mostly, still here. Thousands of them still living here. And they have what are called rights of occupancy. So if I'm a Cherokee person and I've got my little farm, I still have rights of occupancy, even though the state of Georgia has now said, the land is not yours. And so whites and Cherokee live cheek by jowl from really 1832 to 1838 in a very sort of uncomfortable existence. Uh, but 1838, the federal government rounds up the Cherokee, right? And launches what is the Trail of Tears, right? The sending of the Cherokee to modern day Oklahoma. And so off they go, removed from their rich gold lands, removed from their houses, their barns, their sheds, their corn cribs, removed from their fields, their orchards, their ferries, their blacksmith shops, even from the crops they had planted in the spring of 1838. Many of those fields will be harvested by the white intruders who now control that land. And Cherokee removal, and it might have happened anyway, but the gold rush heightened it, the push by white Georgians to occupy Cherokee land. So this is one of those, the big dramas of, really, Georgia from 1829 to 1838. The Southern gold rush and Cherokee removal also provided an impetus and a path for a hugely significant railroad, the Western and Atlantic. And here you just have to kind of understand how people in the Southeast were thinking about things. This was 1820s, 1830s. Oh, they're bringing in new states. These are the years when they build and, you know, the Erie Canal. And so you can take your crops and put them on the Great Lakes, take them over to Erie, Pennsylvania, and then across New York State to, the, to Albany, right? And then down the Hudson River Valley, and suddenly you're in New York City. Or you could, as Abraham Lincoln did as a teenager, <coughs> Take that corn crop, build a flatboat, put your corn on that flatboat, and then, I mean, man, teenagers, nobody gets to do this now, right? Go down, hit the Ohio River, go down to the Mississippi, and then go all the way down to New Orleans. You know, people be calling law enforcement, you know, before you got out of the county. But no, this is how it went. But of course, what does this do? Everything's either coming down the Mississippi River, heading to New Orleans, or it's going across like the National Road, an east-west road, right? That went from Maryland on out to Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, or they're going across the Erie Canal to New York. And where's the southeast? They're like, oh, this is bad news, right? Because none of this is coming here. They're like, we're just going to be a, you know, we're going to be left behind. And so in South Carolina, they said, all right, we got to change things. We've got to build a big railroad. And so they come up with plans to build what at the time would have been like by far the longest railroad in the world, okay? And it would have gone from Charleston, South Carolina, and it would have gone up through Columbia, and then it would have crossed the Appalachian Mountains and connected to Cincinnati, Ohio, and Louisville, Kentucky. And then you'd be on the Ohio River, you know? And um, uh, this failed. Okay. It, they built it parts of it in South Carolina. Nobody else was nearly as interested. It's actually pretty hard to build a railroad across the Appalachian Mountains. 
And so they're like, mm, it just it just wasn't happening. But Georgians looked at this and they said, oh, you know what? We see an easier way now that we control these Cherokee Nation lands. And in 1836, the state of Georgia approved the building of a railroad. It would be a state-owned railroad, so it wouldn't be in private hands. It would be a public utility. And, and that it would go from somewhere south of the Chattahoochee River to the Georgia state line close to the Tennessee River. So it's, you know, so they're like, we know we want to get connected to the Tennessee River, but of course the Tennessee River doesn't come through Georgia. You know, it comes close, but not through. But they thought, we can just get that railroad right on up there. Surely the railroads that are already being built coming out of Savannah and Augusta will want to hook to that railroad and that railroad will go up and the Tennesseans will help us get access to the Tennessee River. And once you're on the Tennessee River, well, you know, you just go down the Tennessee. Okay, that's a little tidbit of what our program was last night. I'm going to give you a little bit more in just a few minutes because I want you to kind of see how this ended. I hope that you will pick up a copy of Dr. Ken Wheeler's book. It was very interesting and honestly, I don't know how much Georgia history the kids learn in school and how much they learn about the Cherokee removal, but it, it was a crime. It was an actual crime, and in my mind, we should never have gotten by with it, and it's, ve it's very, very sad. But the history of the Cherokee runs deep, and in Ball Ground this year, we're going to have some really cool stuff going on with the history of the Cherokee, and I'm going to share more of that with you in the near future. I want to go back to this recipe that we did quickly because I wanted to do something that kids could create with their mom and dad. Okay, you think about it. We got fresh strawberries, we got canned pineapple in its own juice because I kept it as natural as possible. And then I bought these sinful but really yummy bouncers. This is, this is a mini Twinkie that's glazed, so really cool. And then I got the strawberry little Debbies and I sliced it in little pieces. And this one has the little um, Twinkie in it. And they're really, really good. They're really loaded up with sugar, so I don't advise putting maybe one in your recipe. And then we used Cool Whip, and then we used the spray whipping cream, and then I used a little dab of this because I like this canned icing is, is the greatest is the greatest secret known to man. And then I have these beautiful strawberries left, and I want to remind you the Ag Department at Creek View does an amazing program every single year selling these strawberries. I have these sitting here in the natural pineapple juice, and that gives them just a little bit of a kick of sweet. But I want to share, a lot of folks have said, now how do you make your strawberry cobbler? Okay, I would make my strawberry cobbler. I cut the strawberries up, wash them, head them, put them in an 11 by 13 pan. Then I pour Sprite over them. I don't add any sugar to the strawberries. I pour Sprite over them. And for an 11 by 13, I use a stick and a half of butter, melted butter and then add about three-fourths a cup of sugar and three-fourths a cup of flour to the melted butter. You stir it up and you look at it and if it's not the consistency of thick creamed potatoes, you add a little bit more flour and a little bit more sugar, equal amounts of flour and sugar. Stir it up again. If it's the consistency of the thick, thick creamed potatoes and you dollop it on top of your strawberries and it's just these beautiful strawberries with a Sprite poured over them and cover them good so there's liquid over them, you know. Um, and depending on the size pan you want to use, everybody I know likes a lot of crust, so so we kind of over crust it. But, but it's such an easy, easy recipe and something that your kids will be fascinated that they can just take these fresh strawberries, pour a Sprite over them in a baking dish, and then three ingredients, your crust is done, put it in the oven, do it at about 385, and in just 30 minutes, 30, 45 minutes, your cobbler is done and ready to serve. Now, do I advise doing this to that hot cobbler? No, 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 no. I say go get you some Mayfield vanilla ice cream and use the Mayfield vanilla ice cream with your strawberry cobbler. So, so it is a simple, simple, great spring recipe, and it's wonderful. It's wonderful for Easter because your grandkids are going to be over visiting. You're going to have company coming in. So this is a great, great recipe to share and to get the kids in the kitchen with you. And it's all about if you don't teach them how to cook, they're not going to know how to cook. They're not going to pick up a cookbook and get interested. It's our responsibility to get those kids in the kitchen and get them interested in cooking. So what happened to me, I have so many amazing women to thank for the reason I do what I do in the kitchen. 
Now we're going to go back to Dr. Ken Wheeler. He was a great speaker last night. It was very informative. It was very interesting because we had a good crowd in the audience and it was, I, I loved hearing people's questions and the information and, and the answers that he gave. If you're interested more in his program, you can check him out at Reinhardt. He is a professor there now and he teaches, I think he teaches four days a week. But it was very interesting and he and Dr. Joe Kitchens love to talk about the history of Georgia. So it's a great program and again, thanks to Reinhardt for um, doing what they do to, to bring a higher education and, and do a great job of it. So we're gonna go back to Dr. Wheeler and uh, I hope that you will get a little bit more out of this from him and then I hope you'll contact him and pick up a copy of his book. The build furnaces, some of you probably know Cooper's Furnace or some of the other furnaces that existed down there. They've got an iron rolling mill, you know, so you can take that iron and turn it into sheets, you know, of iron that can be used for all kinds of things. Uh, the waterfall, the water power, right, produced by the Etowa River also powers a, a large uh, grain mill. And uh, it, uh, it takes the wheat grown by area farmers and turns it into flour that they would then barrel and then they would send it on down the railroads to Savannah, and to Charleston, a lot of places in the southeast. And, and you gotta keep that in mind too, like what are they growing up here? It's wheat. You know, you can barely grow cotton in ball ground. You know, we're just not enough frost-free days, you know? And so up here, it really is corn traditionally in Cherokee culture, but as white settlers come in, a lot more wheat being grown. And, you know, the people who are here, they look around, they're like, huh, gold mining, that sounds cool. How about railroading? That's interesting. Got their iron mine, iron going with these iron ore mines. We've got, uh, you know, we've got a lot of uh, flour mills up and down the Etowa River. And they develop, I argue, a vision of a future Georgia that has a, a diversified economy. So this, is, slavery would still be central in their minds, but it wouldn't just be cotton-dominated plantations. The Georgia that they're thinking about is going to be a Georgia that's going to have these railroads, wheat farmers, iron manufacturers, mining. And the person who comes into a lot of this kind of vision and I think sees what could happen in the future is a young fellow <coughs> named Joseph e. Brown. And Joe Brown, he will become... I would argue the most influential Georgian of the late of the latter half of the 19th century. Uh, he's born in 1821, just across the border from Georgia, just uh, just over in South Carolina. And and during the gold rush, when he's a teenager, his family moves outside of Dahlonega, and so Joe Brown becomes immersed in a world where he sees land values shooting sky high, plummeting to nothing. People sought gold, sometimes found it. When the government built the branch mint in Dahlonega, Joe Brown is there to see it being built. He's like, oh yeah. And in 1843, so he's a, what, early 20s, he moves to Canton to be a school teacher, head of the Etowa Academy. And he lands in the hands of a bunch of enterprising Baptists. <laughs> William Grisham was one of the founders of Canton. He's a, a trustee and co-founder of the Etowah Academy. Uh, and, and Brown, he knows what's good for him. He joins the Baptists in Canton. And his pastor is a fellow named John W. Lewis. And Lewis is a minister, but he's also a doctor, a politician, a land developer. And pretty soon he builds an iron furnace. And uh, Lewis takes Brown under his wing. You know how sometimes people who are, on, you know, who are like, have it going on, they see young, promising talent, and they're like, ooh, let me help you. You know what I mean? You know how that happens? Have you ever seen that? It happens. It's real. And Lewis says, Brown, you're such a good teacher. You got to come tutor my children. And Brown tutors Lewis's children. And Lewis says, and Brown isn't going to be a school teacher forever. This is just like, it's stepping stone. Brown's going to be an attorney. And Lewis says, well, I'm glad you're reading. You don't have to go to law school. You just read law. 
But Lewis says, you should be a good attorney. How about I loan you money so you can go to Yale for a year? Brown says, all right. So he takes the loan. Off he goes to Connecticut, right, for a year of finishing his legal education. And when Brown comes back, you know, I mean, obviously, he's committed to the bar. He starts working as an attorney. And he, he has business deals with William Grisham, right, his fellow Baptist. And he marries Grisham's niece. And, uh, and her father is a wealthy South Carolina mill owner, slave owner, uh, temperance advocate, and Baptist minister. And so Brown starts, he does legal work for John W. Lewis. He starts collecting money that's owed to some of the iron makers. So he's seeing what's going on. He'll do work in Canton, but he'll also go over to Cassville and do legal work there. So he's crossing the Western Atlantic Railroad. So he's looking, you know, he sees the gold rush. He sees how things work. And, um, and you know, just my, you know, this is a time before Yelp reviews. This is a time before the Better Business Bureau, you know. I mean, in any time, right, people ask, who can you trust? You know, who can you trust? And, uh, and at that time, a lot of it is, it's family connections and denominational connections, you know? My pastor vouches for him, you know? Or I know her, and she knows what he was like at that church in that other place. And either I will or I won't do business on that basis. And temperance is big, too, you know? It's a, for Joe Brown, his idea is, you know, it's not those losers drinking away their lives down at the tavern. I'm going to hook up with these temperance advocates who are, you know, they've got ambition. They're going places. And so Joe Brown, he serves a term in the state legislature. He runs successfully for a judgeship. And he also has an interest in a budding copper mine just on the south side of Canton, the Canton Copper Mine. And he winds up selling that land. And for him, for Joe Brown, who's still in his early 30s, it's, it's $20,000. It's $20,000. And for a point of comparison, in the 1850s, Abraham Lincoln is one of the high-flying attorneys in the state of Illinois. And he's making $5,000 a year. I mean, he's like top. And he's making $5,000 a year. Joe Brown does one deal on a copper mine, $20,000. I'm telling you. Okay, I hope that we have encouraged you to get involved in Georgia history. If you don't know all the history of the state of Georgia, it is time to do a little research. Get online. Uh, go sign up for the class at, at Reinhardt. Go take you some courses on it. It is amazing to me how many people move here and don't understand the gold rush. They don't understand the slavery. They don't understand the cotton fields. They don't understand many of the things that we as Southerners, our ancestors came up with, and certainly they don't understand what happened to the Cherokee and the removal of the Cherokee. We know it is documented that over 5,000 Cherokee lost their lives on the Trail of Tears. I would say that number is a minimal amount reported that there were probably many, many more who lost their lives. So today, if you're going up to North Carolina, go by and, and spend some time and, and get to know the history of the Cherokee and the Carolina Mountains. It is not as well known as the removal because they think there that many of them fled unto these hills and they were hidden away and protected and didn't have to go on the Trail of Tears, although many of them did. But in Georgia, it looks like we did a clean sweep and it, it's a shame to be a part of our history that we truly removed people that had uh, farmed and managed and owned this land for many, many years before we got involved in it. So, um, so today, think about the Cherokee and think about the history. Also plan a trip over to the Chief Van House and get to know everything about the Chief Van House because um, there was a lot of wealth in Cherokee Nation. There was a lot of wealth left behind and sadly, um, somebody is responsible for it. So, so get to know about it. Tomorrow, Bill Senyard will be here and his sweet daughter Kaylee will be visiting. She is coming in. She, is, uh, she lives up in Pigeon Forge. She is a now a very, very 
productive songwriter. She's doing a great job with that. She's raising a whole bunch of kids and doing what she loves and, and following her dream. And they're going to be talking about following your dream and how important it is to do something that you love. I hope today, while the sun is out a little bit and the temperatures aren't so cold, get out and do something you love. Even if it's just go visit an old creek side or go visit an old cabin and take some pictures, take some spring photos and share them on Facebook. I think it enlightens everybody. I've been posting everybody's yard. I stop and I take pictures of your yard. So if you see me out there with my phone, it's because I'm capturing your flowers. Get out and enjoy the moment. Spring is here. We'll probably have another cold snap and that'll be okay. But spring is here and I can, I can show you it is. I drive a black car that's yellow, so there you go. I hope that you'll have a good afternoon and I hope that you'll do something for somebody else. And, uh, you know, be kind, be good, and, and be productive. Get out and do something for somebody else. I'll see you again soon, only on ETC.